All right, well, let's pray. We're going to get into the word. Um, yeah, what I'm going to do, they said we're having communion today. We're going to do communion at the end of the service because my message really ties into communion. So um, just be thinking about communion as, uh, as I'm giving the message. Where was I, Pam, before you interrupted me? Where was I? <laughs> We were going to pray. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Father, I just thank you for Jesus and everything he means to us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. Sin is our peculiar problem, Lord. And Jesus, you're the answer. Lord, thank you for your love, your eternal love that you have for us. It's going to go on forever and ever and ever. We want to be with you, Lord. Where you are, we want to be, Lord. And we know we are in the Spirit. We look forward to that day. Lord, come quickly. I pray for this body of believers. I pray that we grow. I pray that we learn to live like Jesus. I pray that we learn that Jesus is the most exciting, the most worthy person of worship in the universe. That he is Lord. He's worthy of complete obedience. He's worthy of our just our love and adoration. He is the bright and morning star. There ain't no boy or no girl like Jesus. He's unique and singular. And we love him. And I pray, Lord, that we'll just learn to love you more today and follow you, Lord, better. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, well, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Philippians. I was struggling. There is so much. It's good to see you. Very good to see you. Uh, I'm going to invite your dad to the Saturday. Yes. I'm going to invite him. Did I get his number? I think so. Okay, good. Time to come. He can? Okay, good, good. I look forward to it. So I was thinking, I have so many things on my heart and mind. There's so many things going on in our country and and uh, you, sir, we prayed for you to get here that Thursday night. This is the gentleman we were praying for. He had all those problems trying to get in the country and all the stuff going on in our country. And I don't know if the problem was here or there or where it was, but you know, we, we prayed for you to get in. We're glad you're here. But there's so many things going on in our nation, and I feel so torn. I'm going to have to preach a message. I want to get with the elders and talk about it, just about where we're at in our country and some of the things going on. Uh, and I want to be real careful when I preach it, so, but I just, there's so much on my heart. We're, we're really living in quite some times right now. Would anybody agree with that? It's real living in, could, could be perilous times, but I want to preach about something different today, and I've been talking about transformation, and you know, when you're born again, we know that our righteousness is the righteousness of God in Christ. We know, and I preached a couple weeks ago, how we don't earn our righteousness. Righteousness is a gift that God gives us because Jesus died on that cross. And just like when the serpent was lifted up on the pole and people looked at that serpent and they were healed, when we look at Jesus, our sin-sick soul is healed. Our sins are washed away. And God looks at us through the eyes of Christ. If humanity knew how much they needed Jesus, every church in this country would be full. People would be coming into churches saying, do you have the answer? How can I be forgiven for my sins? I'm going to stand before a holy God. I need to know, are my sins forgiven? If people really knew, if our eyes were open, then our hearts were open. And it's through looking at that cross and seeing what Jesus did for us, God gives us righteousness as a gift. It comes by grace. And we've learned that the beautiful thing is not only is this gift of righteousness, God gives it to you. It's like, do you want to be righteous? He, you, do you notice when Jesus healed people, you know, sometimes we try to force someone to be healed, candy, you know, we try to make them get healed. Do you notice when Jesus healed somebody, he would look at them and he'd say, do you want to be whole? Do you want to be whole? And, and the, you know, most smart people would say, yeah, I want to be healed. I want to be whole. But not everybody wants to be whole. Not everybody wants to let go of their sin. Not everybody wants to live for Jesus. Not everybody wants to let go of our, our way, our selfishness. But when you get a taste of Jesus, many of us do 
want to let go of our way and follow him. But the same grace that saves us, the same grace that wipes away your sin is the same grace that will transform your life. You say, Brother Brad, why don't we see more transformation or more people that look like Jesus in the world? I think partially, anyway, I don't have all the answers. I don't pretend I do. They're all in here. Amen? But I think part of it is we get into this thing by God's grace. He gives us a gift of righteousness. And man, when the Lord opens our eyes and the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, we're like thirsty camels. We run after that. And we receive God's gift of righteousness by grace. But because we are so broken and our thinking is so corrupted, we think that somehow now that we've earned it, that God's given us this thing as a gift, now we have to earn it. So we have to go out and do a lot of things. And you read in the Bible, Jesus is talking about feeding the poor. Should we feed the poor? And by the way, did we do anything with that lady, the size six clothing? Did we put that out on the... uh, Okay, so we're going to get that out. If you Size six for girls. Uh, Julie met a homeless lady. She's doing what Jesus wants us to do. And I'm sorry if I embarrass you, but she met this lady. She's helping her and her granddaughter needs clothing. It's size six. So if you've got size six girls clothing, let Julie know over here. She's trying to help this girl that was dropped off by her mother and abandoned. And now her grandmother has her hands full and she needs help. Julie did what Jesus would tell us to do. She took her in. She's trying to help her. Isn't that what Jesus wants us to do? But sometimes we think that all these things we're doing, that somehow these things that we're doing are going to make us more righteous. So we start off and we start trying to do so many things. But after a while, all this works mentality and trying to work, 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 it can wear you down if you think that everything you're doing is going to make God love you more or you're going to become more righteous. Do you know that you can't be any more righteous than the blood of Jesus? How could you be? You can't be. Now, I'm not saying that your works can't be more righteous. I'm not saying that your deeds can't be more righteous. And I'm not even saying that you're not going to stand before God one day and answer for your works because you will stand before God and answer for your life. There is a judgment seat of Christ. It's called the Bema seat of Christ. God, you're going to look at God and he's going to let you know whether you have finished your assignment or not. That's why I'm always encouraging you to get busy for the Lord. Find out what you're here for and do it. You will be held responsible for that. But regarding righteousness, your righteousness cannot increase because Jesus is your righteousness. Someone say amen. So we get this mindset that we've begun by faith, we began by grace, and now we're going to finish it by works. But that's not how it works. It is a love relationship. When Jesus commanded the church to repent, what he told them was, he didn't say that you stopped doing this. He said you left your first love. He said it's a matter of your heart. What's going on in your heart? You left your first love. It was not hard for me this morning to make my wife a cup of coffee. And I even, guys, I get this coffee and I make it and I know exactly how much cream she wants in that coffee. And I pour just that much coffee. If it's too milky, I have failed my assignment. (laughs) And she made me coffee for years. So I like to go over there and I like to set it down in front of her and put it down and I adjust that little plate. I make it just perpendicular. I set it down and I look at her and I say, is that all? She usually says, smiles. She smiles at me and it's all worth the smile. And she goes, yeah, that's all. I love her. I love her. It's so easy to work for my bride because I love her. I remember one time I almost lost my job. And I've shared some of this stuff I know, but some of you are new. I almost lost my job and it, I was so concerned, not for me. I'll go crawl in a hole somewhere. I'll go down to Honduras and find Char- Charlie or something. I can go, I can hide somewhere in some hole. But I, but I thought, oh my goodness, what, what, what am I gonna do with Pam if I lose my job? How am I gonna pay the more? And it was because I love Pam. And we had six cats. We had, how many cats did we have at that time? We had four cats, I'm sorry, yeah. We had four cats. 
We won't say how many we have now. They chose us. We didn't choose them. And I was sitting there thinking, you know, because I love my cats. And I'm thinking, how will I feed my cats? What's going to happen to my... You know, what we do has great consequence, doesn't it? And I was very concerned about that. It's because I love my wife. When you love somebody, and this is, I want to talk about this. Your works, Paul said that love should be our aim. Because when your works for God are rooted in your love for God, they flow out of your heart. And they are spontaneous. When someone, when one of these young kids asked me for a ride or, you know, someone, I had a young man get a hold of me today and say, hey, can you take me to youth group? If my heart is cold and, you know, I don't want to do anything for anybody, it's a grudge to me. Oh, I don't want to, pan. I got to go pick up this, you know. When you love people, when you love God in your heart, it's just like, of course I want to get you. Of course I want you to be a part. Love makes everything easy. But when our love dies and, and slows down, it makes everything hard. Love is our aim. And it's always the vertical. When I do these sermons about marriage, I always talk about self-sacrifice. How Jesus is the example of a marriage. How he laid down his life and gave it for the church. Shed his blood. He covered. He washed the church. He covered the church. And I'm always telling husbands, that's how you need to be to your wife. You need to lay down your life for your bride, for your husband. Just, I said, if you do that, you'll never have a problem with your wife. I said, she'll love you and she'll respect you and she'll follow your, your leadership if you lay down your life for her. And girls, I wouldn't settle for anything less than that. Love is not about what I can get out of this relationship. Love is about what we can give into the relationship. And that's what Jesus did for us. And to this very day, he's looking out. And everybody, I don't care what you've done or what, you're, what you did this week. Jesus is looking at you right now for good. There is a judgment day coming. And there will be a day when the, God the Father will judge you. If you don't know God, there will be a day when a holy God, you will stand before Him and you will experience the wrath of God. If the blood of Jesus has not covered your sins, if the blood of Jesus has not wiped away your sin, you will stand before God and you will answer for every thought and every selfish deed you've ever done. If you're a believer, you will stand before Jesus. And as I said before, you'll give an account for that. But right now, the Bible says there's no condemnation in Christ. Christ is looking at every single person in here for good. He's trying to take you from where you are to get you to the next point. And his desire and his heart for you is good. He's looking over you. He wants to sing over you. He wants to dance over you. He wants to celebrate over you. He does want to pour out his spirit on you. And he wants to do you good. Because he loves you. That's the heart of God. When we really get this thing right. Man, I want to get it right. I preach this a lot. We're doing communion, so I got to preach it again. But I know if I could not worry about myself for one second this week, I would have a completely peaceful week. If I wouldn't even think about myself all week, if I would just think about others, if I would consider God and what God's purposes are for me, and I would turn my focus off of myself and all my problems and everything that's going on. And I would begin to focus on others. I would come in here next week hilariously happy. The human condition of sin, and I've preached it many times, is rooted in selfishness. And Jesus is the antidote. Turn to your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. I want to show you something in here. I preached this message years ago, and it was resonating on my heart about the Apostle Paul's attitude, about the Apostle Paul, how he transformed, how he changed. Many of us, and I'm one of, one of you, we want to heal the sick and see God do miracles. Anybody want to see miracles? Not everybody does, but does anybody want to see miracles? Does anybody want to be one of those people that prays and gets your prayers answered? Does anybody want to be someone that you, you lay hands on people and somehow they, they, they get healed and you, you, know, you don't even know how it can't be your power, can it? It just has to be, you just have to be some conduit because the power has to come from God. Amen? 
Who wants to be one of those people? And I think a lot of times, and I, and I preach this too, I said, you know, we focus on that so much, we make that, if we change our perspective and we take on the attitude of Christ and we take on the attitude that Paul took on, imitating Christ, I really believe that miracles and answered prayer and these things will be a natural byproduct of a supernatural life. It won't be a struggle for you. Number one, you won't have to get up a bunch of courage to do it. The love of God, Paul said, the love of God compels me. It's the love of God in me. That word compel, he means God's love inside of me constrains me. It overmasters me. It compels me. I've just got to tell somebody. I've got to pray for somebody. I've got, there's something inside of me, and there is something inside of me, Charlie, and it won't stop. I've told you before, I've run people down before because there's something inside of me. That lady that I uh, t talked about last week, I saw her. She was running the other way, but I saw her. You bet I prayed for her. She was heading that way, I was going this way, but I saw her and I'm praying for her. I want to talk to her again. When the love of Christ overmasters you or it takes over your person, when we yield to the Spirit, it gets to be a natural response. Supernatural things in your life become natural. Because it's not you doing it. It's Christ in you. It should not be hard. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He didn't say, I want to put more religious burdens on you. Not only do you got to keep the Sabbath and be, and, and Sabbath and be circumcised. Not only do you not commit adultery. Not only don't you have to give a tithe. Not only don't you, but now I want you to heal the sick too. And if that's not enough, I want you to raise the dead. And if that's not enough, I want you to give all your money to the poor. Pretty soon, following Jesus is going to be a very heavy load because you're going to say, I don't know how to raise the dead. Someone say amen. I don't know how to heal the sick. I don't know how to love my neighbor. And Christianity becomes more of a burden. And that's why I see young people run away from it in droves because it's more of a burden to them, more of a hassle to them. They don't understand the dynamics of it and they run from it in droves. If it becomes just a religion, if it becomes like the Old Testament was an outer ordinance, it was something that you were compelled to do to earn God's favor, something that you had to do to please mom and dad. You, you got to be good for mom and dad. That's, like I said, kids run from that as fast as they can. But if they can see that this thing is an adventure, it's a lifestyle, it's a way of loving God and loving people, it's a way that you can really do some good in this world. Don't you want to feed the hungry? Don't you want to help orphans? Don't you want to help kids that are being sexually exploited? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could pray for somebody and they got healed? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could pray for people and your prayers got answered, that God really heard you when when you were praying for people wouldn't that be awesome and wouldn't you want to do it all the time was well, it true or isn't it i really missy am i getting too loud am i okay okay missy's such a gentle soul let me know if i am i just get excited the key isn't so much in john 14 12 i don't believe You'll do greater works. The key is in these smaller verses that tell us what was in the heart of Jesus, what was in the heart of Paul. And I was reading Philippians one time, and I, I don't have them all circled, but I just started circling, and I'll, I'll read some of it. And I noticed Paul had a you problem. He had a you focus. Girls, I want you to see this. This is your apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles. And you're a Gentile, whether you realize it or not. Look at all those yous in your. See that? Paul had a you problem. He was always focusing on other people. His letter was written to them. He said, I had you in my heart. I was praying for you. I was asking about you, you, you. And you go through that book. His concentration, Paul wasn't looking at these Philippians as somebody that was going to do something for him. His focus was on God blessing them. He was praying for them. He was preaching the gospel for them. He was contending for them. Listen to this. He said, grace and peace to you. I remember you. I make my prayers for you in view of your participation in the gospel. 
a God who began a good work in you. It is right for me to feel this way about you. Listen to this. I have you in my heart. The confirmation of the gospel for you. How I long, how I desire, how I long for you. And this I pray that your love may abound so that you may be approved. He says, now I want you to know, brothers, brethren. I am convinced that I will continue with you for your progress so that your proud conference, uh, confidence in me may abound. That I might be, uh, my concern for you might be manifested. I want to come see you. I want to hear about you. That you're standing firm. For you it has been granted to suffer for Christ. It's a, he has a you problem. Do you know, and I preach it many times, you cannot get offended in a church if you're looking out for the other person, it's impossible. Can't have a church split. You can't have a problem. Wives, takes two to tango. Husbands, takes two to tango. Just because there's a fight doesn't mean you have to join it. Church, takes two to get offended. And then Paul, after talking about this you focus he has, then he talked about the root or the reality of where this came from. And I want to say this, this transformation of your soul, of your mind is not only possible, it'll come by the grace of God if you want it. If you don't have it, it's only because you don't want it. You don't earn it. You seek after it, you pray, you knock, you ask, you seek, but it is giving to, given to you by grace, but you got to want it. If you don't want it, you're not going to have it. And I think that's what blessed are those that are hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Of course, Christ is our righteousness and every drink that we need has already been supplied. But if you don't want to come and take a drink, you're not going to get one. He says, come unto me, you that are thirsty. If you're not thirsty, you won't come. This gift of sanctification, this gift of dying to yourself, changing perspective, comes by God's grace. There is a participation. You know how Jesus said, if you follow me, you have to die to yourself. That scares people like I don't know how to die to myself. Do you know the Holy Spirit, by many great British theologians, as a matter of fact, Irish, British theologians, said the Holy Spirit is the divine undertaker. The Holy Spirit knows how to put you in situations. And he knows how to take the word of God. And he knows how to lead you through your identification with Christ in his death. Where you can experimentally or actively participate with him. Where you learn through prayer and fellowship with Jesus. You learn to lay down yourself. To die to yourself. Participate in that Christ's crucifixion. Paul says, I have been or I was crucified with Christ. He said, nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ. There is an active participation in that through the power of the Holy Spirit. He'll walk you right through it. Many times as a Christian, listen to me, you get put in those situations. I get put in those situations and we run from them. We complain. We bellyache. We gossip. We don't look at these situations where Christ has brought us to the end of ourself, the death of ourself, embrace it and say, God, I will go through this with you. We choose rather to complain, bellyache, and we miss the blessing that that trial. God wants us to walk through this process of sanctification 
where we die to ourselves, and the reason he does that is so Christ can be manifested in our mortal body. Paul said, I die daily. He said, I die daily. I go through this, he says, but I want the power of Christ to be manifested in my mortal flesh. Now, he's going to give us our example in Christ. And I want to tell you again, this is not something that you will do on your own. No one ever crucified himself. Can you imagine trying to crucify yourself? Think about it. It's okay. It's okay. Can you imagine trying to crucify yourself? You can't do it, can you? Can you put yourself up on a cross and you can't do it. People will put you there. Your trials will put you there. Life will put you there. A lot of times those trials and those temptations are an opportunity for you to give up on your selfishness and your selfish perspective. When Jesus went to the cross, he was a completely innocent, guiltless, sinless man. But it was the sins of others that put him on that cross. And it'll be the sins of others that'll put you on your cross too. He says, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Get this. Do nothing from selfishness, or empty conceit, King James says, vainglory, do nothing from selfishness. What does nothing mean? Can anybody tell me? What's nothing mean? It means nothing, right? In the Greek, it means nothing. It says, do nothing from selfishness or vainglory, but with humility of mind, this is so powerful, regard one another as more important than you are. Wouldn't that change the family life? Regarding your brother and sister is more important than you. Wouldn't that be a change, huh? That changes stuff, doesn't it? For everybody. Regard one another as more important than you. I haven't always succeeded at this. I've failed many times at this regarding other people. In fact, the problems I've had in life, most of them are right there. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also look out for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is Jesus' attitude. This is the attitude that we are learning. I don't know that anybody is completely there, but we're learning this attitude day by day, with the power of the Holy Spirit, although he existed in the form of God, and we know Jesus was God in the flesh, we fully believe in his divinity. He existed in the form of God. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. And what that means is, is he didn't hold on to his divine rights and privileges when he was on earth as a man. He could have. Anybody ever heard the song, he could have called 10,000 angels? He could have. Jesus said, the Father gave me the right, the permission. I can lay my life down or I can pick it up. He gave me that right. Did he lay it down or did he pick it up? The word says in verse 7, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. And he became made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. For this reason, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, name in heaven, name on earth, and names under the earth. We sang about it today. 
we prayed with that name today, that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then he says, after he gets done talking about this, he turns his focus back to them, and he says, so then, my beloved, just as you have always... Now, Paul's going to cuss here, okay? You guys ready for this? Don't be shocked by it. Just as you have always obeyed. That can be a dirty word in the church, obedience. Just as you have always obeyed. We don't like that word, obeyed. Sarah obeyed her husband. She did? Yeah, she did. She obeyed him. We don't like that word. Well, 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 well. <laughs> I can just hear the mind, the mind's creaking. She obeyed him. She didn't give lip service. She didn't talk about him. She did what he asked her to do. And you, boy, if you know just how she obeyed him, it would, it's mind zapping to the extent that she obeyed him. I won't meddle there too long. Not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now listen to this. Work out. He didn't say work for, and this is key. You're not working for it. You're working out your salvation. And he, and he tells you this is the grace part. The next verse is the grace part. How I go to this verse all the time in prayer. I claim this. We talk about claiming a promise. It says, for it is God who is working in you. That is the grace. That's my salvation. Man, if I had to do this on my own, if I had to love people, if I had to be a witness, if I had to do on my own, if I was left to my own devices, I would be so helpless and so hopeless. But he says, it is God who is at work in you, and he's working in you to desire and to act, to will and to do. There's your salvation. He doesn't leave you in your disobedience. He doesn't leave you in your sin. He doesn't leave you where you're at. He sees where you're at. He loves you where you're at. He embraces you where you're at. He's willing to bring you in where you're at, but he is not going to leave you the same. And if you have the desire to change, he says God is working in you to will and to do. So if there's anything that God puts in your heart, he's giving you the power to do it. So what's left? What's our part? What do you guys think? What's our part? So, yeah, to be obedient, to want it, to seek it, to ask for it, because God is the one that's doing it. Paul doesn't tell you to try a little harder. He's not a self-help thinker. Did you know that? I like self-help. I like to be motivated. I like motivational speakers. I like all that. But Paul's not a self-help speaker. Paul's not telling you that I can do anything. Whatever I set my mind to do, I can do it. He's not telling you that. That's not his perspective. Paul's perspective is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's not telling you I can grit. How many times have we tried to pick ourselves up one more time by our bootstraps only to fail? How many times have we left church thinking, I'm going to witness to my neighbor. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Only to just by Wednesday, we're already out of steam. I think at first when you get motivated in Christ, you might last for three months or four months. Eventually, you, you run out of steam if you're operating on your own steam. But the longer you're, you're in this, the shorter your time period where your emotions and your own steam won't take you there. But when God is working it in you, to will and to do of his own good pleasure. That's the grace of God. And all you got to do is want it. And I've taught this, Gary, a hundred times, making a hundred and one. So my secret is prayer. My secret is going to God and shutting the door and saying, here I am again, Lord. Here I am again. My secret is going to the throne of grace to get grace. If you're being hounded by something, you got a sin in your life and you feel like you can't be rid of it, you feel like you can't be free from it, your answer is right here. God is working in you. He's, he can take that sin in one nanosecond. When I gave up smoking, I didn't even give it up. God just took it from me. It happened in a nanosecond. 
I, to me, I, cigarettes are the last thing that I want. That's available to all us of, if, us, of us if we're hungry. I'm going to say this, and we're going to get into, we're going to move into communion. The whole nature of Christianity, the whole nature of our fellowship with God through Jesus is life out of death. Jesus crucified, nailed on a cross. When Paul went to the Corinthian church, he said that I only want to know one thing, and that's Christ crucified among you. That's all I want to know is Jesus crucified among you. That's all I'm looking at. The whole nature of Christianity is a man crucified on a cross and your victory coming through that death, through Christ's death. When we celebrate communion, what we're celebrating is the blood and the body of Jesus. We're celebrating that a man died on a tree. And on that tree, his sacrificial, life-giving death wiped away all your sin. Not only did it wipe away your sin, but the Word of God says that he took your old creation life, the old person that you used to be, and he nailed that old person, your old man, to the cross with him. So you could become a new creation and you could learn to walk in the spirit. And so you could enter the kingdom of God and learn to live a life in the spirit of abundance. He did that right on that cross. His blood cleansed all your sins. And through his body, his death, burial, and resurrection, he made a way that you could be new. Some people preach this thing like it's just your sins are forgiven and you hold on till you get to heaven. That's far from it. When we embrace this thing for what it really is, and our, our heart is aflame with it, and, and, and our heart is turned on fire with it, the very nature and character of Christ is formed in us. Then those things that are hard for you to do, become just, it becomes your nature. It becomes who you are. It becomes your existence.